Thank you, Harry. And uh, we are here to assist with the last panel session of this conference. And we will have this nice journey through computational electromagnetics, past, present, and future. And uh, the speaker, I think, is well known. We do not have to introduce him. Is uh, Jim Fali from the Ohio State University. Uh, we agreed uh, to have a 45 minutes presentation, then we will have uh, 10 minutes for discussion, and uh, so we can save uh, five minutes to go to the next uh, set of sessions. Thank you, Angelo, for the uh, introduction, and thank you uh, for the organizing for the presentation. So this uh, talk, um, uh, I look at the material which I uh, prepared. Uh, it seems like you know, maybe I should change the title to be uh, Computational Electromagnetics, uh, My Past, My Present, and My Future. <laughs> so it's a pretty, uh, pretty much the uh, personal viewpoint of uh, uh, last uh, 30 years of uh, CEM. <coughs> okay. Okay. Ah. So uh, uh, let me uh, talk um, uh, first. Uh, when uh, I first start, uh, and uh, almost. Uh, 100% at a time, all the numerical computation is all based upon what we call a conformal kind of numerical computation. So this is a kind of an interesting thing. Uh, when I was involved with a, a commercial company, uh, at a time, because we are doing a finite element, the first thing that we need, need to do is to have a robust message generation. And uh, uh, as a uh, Trivia is solved to have uh, a mesh generation which can actually partition a general three dimensional object into a union of tetrahedra wasn't such a trivial task. So it took us uh, a few months uh, to get the program to the, uh, to the uh, stage that we are able to mesh this uh, finite holes, yeah, so to speak. And then uh, here you see also the uh, uh, mesh of moment all based upon so-called conformal mesh. The conformal mesh primarily is that uh, you have uh, the traditional kind of partition, uh, one edge will be shared by two triangles, so on and so forth. So this is uh, pretty much uh, uh, everything that uh, is done in uh, uh, numerical computation 30 years ago. And still, majority of the numerical computations still follow the conformal type of uh, numerical computation, even uh, FPTD and the finite element rest of moment. So let's uh, start uh, by uh, talking about some of the mathematical foundation of uh, the uh, well-known technique, so to speak. So first, we need to uh, convert from a physical problem into a uh, mathematical model. And the mathematical model that we have is a last word equation. That's really uh, uh, the main thing of uh, this uh, conference. But given in writing down the last word equations, we already have a lot of uh, approximation involved. In the many the real life applications, in many of the engineering applications, we actually don't know exactly what's the material property Yes, We pretend we do, but there's always uh, some uh, ambiguity about uh, the uh, uh, material property, about the shape of the uh, packet, so on and so forth. So I've been writing down the Maxwell equation in here to sort of uh, describe our um, uh, physical problem. It's already a uh, uh, sort of a modeling error introduced by the model that you have. It's nothing wrong with the Maxwell equation, just like uh, the material property that we that we describe, the uh, uh, omega that we uh, describe to the computer, those are the things which are subject to the uh, uh, practical error. Time variable, the same thing. 
So in the, uh, uh, say, the uh, finite dimensional discretization, then we go on and take another mathematical model and try to solve the solution to it. And the common technique uh, all the time for vessel moment or uh, finite element or even FPTD, then what you do afterwards is that um, you have to take this uh, problem that we have from the Maxwell equation and we, in a finite kind of a method like uh, FTTD and the finite element, we actually need to truncate our, our bounded domain into a finite domain. So in the early days, there's a lot of research done on the uh, mesh truncation technique, uh, met, uh, the integral equation, the VB, and uh, the ABC, and uh, PML, so on and so forth, and the model uh, expansion. So once you introduce those uh, mesh truncation uh, technique, again, you introduce another layer of uh, approximation. So look at that, there's a lot of things that we've done already introduce the error into the computation before you even turn on your computer. So the same thing with FTTD as well. So theoretically, we say the uh, when we say the uh, integral equation is the exact uh, kind of uh, mesh truncation, uh, practically there's still quite a bit uh, uh, an issue sometimes uh, when you try to combine FEM and uh, VI together. So here is something which I try to uh, put it all down together in some of the uh, general kind of a framework. When you do meso moment, FTTD, finite element, you will actually need to start by uh, writing down some basis function to represent the mathematical solution you are trying to accomplish. Once you write down that the basis function, then there's already a few approximations involved. And that is actually based upon the uh, numerical method 101, the interpolation. Once you have the uh, smallest solution and using the uh, sort of uh, the polynomial to approximate that uh, uh, function, there's already a uh, uh, projection error that is involved. <coughs> and and uh, afterwards, also, uh, in doing the numerical computation, you also need to uh, approximate your geometry. So in the early days, uh, uh, quite a bit of work, the majority are done on the so-called low order kind of uh, uh, computation. In the final element, you see a lot of times the computation is based upon tetrahedra. Like in, in essence, you are actually approximate the geometry by linear basis function. You are actually approximate the geometry by linear polynomial. So the the error in your in your geometry is order h squared. They already. And then if you use a polynomial basis function and using the so-called uh, uh, polynomial uh, need to be complete, then the uh, projection error will be order h uh, to the power of p plus one, where the h indicates your resolution of your of your computation. And that is uh, the assumption that your solution is smooth enough. Smooth enough means that uh, it can be differentiated in different number of times. And uh, if you talk about the missile moment, uh, again, the missile moment, if you use a triangle, then uh, again, it's approximately your geometry by linear basic function. The geometrical uh, error will be all that to square. And then if you use the RWG basis function, even though RWG basis function is the deal conforming, but RWG basis function really is just a slightly more than constant. You are using piecewise constant to approximate your curve. So the RWG basis function to do the measure moment, the solution in your field is order h kind of accuracy. So if you look at your current, uh, the, the convergence of your curve will be order h. What does that mean by order h? You refine your mesh by a factor of two, you are expect to reduce your error by 50%. And then, uh, and FTTD is something which is a very well known called a dispersion error. On top of that, which means that if you uh, want to solve an electromagnetic problem by FTTD, 
if your problem becomes larger, you actually need to sample five. So ten element per lambda for say uh, five lambda long kind of problem. When you go to a ten lambda long problem to achieve the same accuracy, you probably need to sample twenty element per lambda. This is so-called curse of a dispersion. <coughs> so summary go up. Here's uh, some of the uh, uh, slides about the FTTD. So FTTD is an explicit skin, so you need to uh, do the time margin. There will be a stability condition that you need to uh, uh, compute. So involved in the FTTD, your geometrical error, approximation error, FTTD, uh, in essence, is using a linear basic function, again, to compute your electromagnetic. So the uh, approximation error for the smallest field is order 80 squared. And then there's a dispersion error. We will come back to that uh, later. So, uh, so the accuracy of the uh, FTTD uh, also depends on the size of your problem. But despite that, the FTTD is uh, quite successful in a way that it's a, one of the uh, simplest numerical method you can ever think of. The beauty of that and also the uh, deficiency of that. It's extremely simple and and also comes with like, its own limitation because the FTTD in some way is using the constant basic function to approximate the geometry. So the geometry, the staircasing kind of an error in the FTTD, if your surface is not the Cartesian kind of shape, then you, your uh, error in the geometry is all the age. So that's a pretty heavy price to pay, even though your field error is all the age squared. Beta is made because it's simple. So the oldest of modern uh, sort of a com computer hardware, periodization, all the numerical method. The first one to ever do really good periodization is always FTTD. They always do it. GPU, FTTD. Every single time, periodization, FTTD will be the first one to do. Easy. Yeah. And the efficiency is also extremely high. So here's a sort of an example that uh, my uh, colleague uh, Robert Lee uh, did this uh, paradise uh, FTTD. This uh, figure is actually almost uh, like 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, about uh, 10 billion uh, sales like it did with the army. And then uh, let's talk about the fine element. The fine element then, you really need to talk about the emission truncation. And in the FTTD, uh, you also need to use uh, mesh truncation. And there are many powerful mesh truncation algorithms for FTTD. PML, and then high order ABC, and uh, uh, even the seven orders of the hours uh, ABC, something like that, that the wind chill document is a book. But when you come to the fine element, the beauty of the fine element is it's mathematically sound, but the curse of the fine element is also it's very rigid. So even today, to do so-called the higher order of absorbing boundary condition in the vector fine element in a functional space, that done is not completely correct in the functional space of the uh, ABC for fine element. But the first order kind of impedance boundary condition commonly used, and then after that, if you if you really want to go and do a really accurate computation, that would be the VB. Combine the fine element and the VI together. And this is a, in some way, this is why uh, fine element in some way is a beautiful, yes, uh, together with the mass of moment, they all based upon the reaction principle. So all the sort of a functional that you write down in your formulation of uh, FEM or mass of moment, in a primary mathematics, uh, kind of area, we don't talk a fine element, we don't talk a mass of moment, we just say it's a fine element. Because for us, they are finite and they are elements. So whether it's a surface integral, uh, volume, uh, volume uh, uh, PDE, they all follow the same kind of uh, philosophy. So this is uh, the reaction uh, integral that we write down uh, to start with. <coughs> so, the benefit of the fine element is uh, you actually, uh, if you're using a tetrahedra, so the geometry is all h squared, and 
he also has a uh, uh, suitable for the uh, uh, highly heterogeneous uh, medium. Uh, the sort of uh, the negative of a fine element is tend to be a uh, uh, ill-conditioned system. Uh, there are many ways that uh, you can actually uh, mitigate that, but still it's a sort of a, uh, uh, difficulty there. Then here's uh, something which is kind of interesting. Uh, for quite a bit of time uh, between my friend Robert Lee and some of the uh, uh, prime expectation, there's always uh, some argument. Uh, they accuse my friend to be wrong, so on and so forth. Uh, in a mathematical community, uh, oh, before I go there, actually, why don't we talk about the differential form for time being? The final element, one of the most celebrated uh, accomplishments in the early days is uh, this uh, Dirac uh, complex. The Dirac complex is, uh, is uh, sort of uh, the theory behind why the vector fine element can be successful. So if we look at the Maxwell equations uh, in this way, uh, you probably see similar kind of uh, uh, explanation in the last few days. You look at the Maxwell equations, and this is a differential way of writing down. If you write it in an integral form, then you start to recognize the D and H always associated with uh, line integral and the B and D always associated with the surface integral, charge with the bottom integral, and the potential is a concept of, uh, associated with the point. So if you look at it in your Maxwell equation, electromagnetics uh, kind of uh, uh, physics, we talk about the potential function need to be continuous. If a potential function is not continuous, then you are going to have an electric field to be infinity, and that's going to have uh, the infinite uh, energy uh, for the numerical computation. That's a that's an absolutely no no. We need to have uh, the quantity that we compute to be finite uh, energy. So that's why this uh, square integral kind of thing coming. But as far as uh, electromagnetic is concerned, potential function need to be continuous. And the E, H, A, F, the vector potential A, vector potential F, they need to be tangentially continuous. And uh, B, D, J, the electric current and uh, the artificial magnetic current that's thrown in to uh, make a Maxwell equation a little bit more symmetrical, uh, they need to be normally continuous, charge to be discontinuous. Here is where I want to make a point. Most of the uh, engineer working in the computation electromagnetic look at this and say, in order for me to do numerical computation, my current J need to be using a basic function that has to be no more continuous. Okay? That is a wrong concept. It's actually the area wrong. This is the maximum constraint that you should impose. Because if I use a square integral basis function, my function space is bigger than normal continuous function space. Okay, so this is the minimum function space your solution should reside. The H element, so called the E uh, H, need to be tangentially continuous, and that is the maximum constraint that you want to put on your basis function. Okay, because the, the prettier the prettier function is actually more limited. So if I go, if I want to do a numerical computation, make sure I can always find my solution. I can always uplift it by making my solution space to be bigger. The consequence of that is it will be less efficient. Okay? So I'm trying to find my solution in a much bigger pond if I'm using a much larger function space. But it's not advisable to use a much smaller function space. So you say here, <coughs> the electric field needs to be tangentially continuous. Why don't I just simply use the basic function which are continuous? You see, continuous basic function is uh, prettier than just a tangentially continuous. So if you use a basic function to be a continuous vector basis function, you run the risk not able to find your solution. That's part of the reason that uh, my advisor uh, <coughs> sort of uh, in, in their generation, they have this uh, funny, funny thing going on that um, uh, my advisor and his, uh, his 
I don't know how to say it in English. The, the student before him, the Sebastian student earlier than him, they do the item for the computation using the vector file element and publish a paper drawing. Because in the early days, anything that you can publish on the numerical method, you are the first. So Conrad uh, to publish a few papers. So then send this my advisor, uh, also publish a few papers. But they always feel a little bit uneasy. And that's the reason the conference like this is a, is a wonderful thing. So start, uh, other people start to work, uh, reproduce uh, their uh, work. So go to the conference and start drinking coffee and talking gossip. Yeah, if you done that work, that's a good work. Uh, but there's something weird going on. What, you want to see that too? So they start to talk and there's something called spirit mode start to become a common knowledge. Before that, everybody is swept under the carpet, but then they go to the conference, everybody talk. Oh, you see the spirit mode? I also see the spirit mode. What you meant is, they see the solution which is not the solution to Maxwell equation. So in the early days, they used the, the vector basis function which are continuous. So electric field is not just a continuously continuous, it's actually continuous in straight component. That's a basis function that they use. And they have this uh, spruce mode of preservers. Took a while, so that they prevented the uh, sort of uh, the development of uh, vector finite element into uh, uh, a believable kind of numerical scheme. So here, just uh, using the uh, differential forms and language, the potential function is associated with a point, so we call that zero four. E H is associated with the uh, line integral, we call it 1, 4, and BD is associated with the surface integral, we call it 2, 4, and of course the charge is the 3, 4, and which lead us to this beautiful, beautiful derived sequence. So if you go onto the continuous space, the, take the uh, potential function, take a gradient, it becomes the subs, subs, uh, subs, subset of the E and H. The gradient V is a, is a a uh, special kind of electric field, so on and so forth, and then you take a curve, and that becomes uh, the map into the, the two-form space, and you take a divergence of the two-form becomes three-form. So this is a uh, uh, Maxwell's uh, equation, the sequence, and then in the function space, that's uh, the potential function belong to the continuous function space. So the simple here, yeah, I hope I don't uh, scare you all. It just uh, says simply means it's a continuous function. And this is what we call the curl conforming function space, which means that the electric field not only need to be, not only need to have a finite energy, curl of E also need to have a finite energy, as simple as that. E and curl E both need to be square integrable. And the deeper conforming means that the B need to be square integrable, as well as the divergence of a B need to be square integrable. So this is what we learned in the finite element kind of uh, early days that uh, if we don't uh, utilize the basic function which follow the direct sequence, we are going to have a spruce mode. So consequently, the uh, also beautiful thing come in the H element with the, with the form, zero form, one form, two form, three form, and then um, uh, you have the immediately the element, uh, uh, sort of uh, our tetrahedra, the, uh, first kind of a literary element and the second kind of literary element. And then uh, when you come to the uh, meso moment in the Aquinas uh, medics uh, community, there's a Robert Thomas, and the lowest order becomes uh, the famous RWG basic function that we have in the engineering community. So this is uh, what we say in the uh, uh, five element thing. So if you don't mind, let me uh, put up here uh, some uh, uh, basic slides to really summarize the, oh, the essence of the meso moment and the finite element in some sense. You see, this is a, a simple figure, but it contains quite a bit of uh, information. The U that you see here is the exact solution or the solution to your mathematical problem. And this is this is a plane that you see here is the the basis function, the span of all the basis function that you choose. So once you choose the basis function, and this is your exact solution, so to speak, there's already a projection there. 
So once you choose the basic function, it doesn't matter whether it's a mess of moment or, or finite mess in, in run. Okay, you take your exact solution, project out to that uh, basic function spin you have, and this is the projection solution. And the exact solution to that projection solution, just from the classical projection theory, you know that they are orthogonal. And what is the mess of moment solution and what is the finite moment solution? They are on this plane, but not this projection. It's somewhere, somewhere here. So the UN is your numerical solution. So UN is your numerical solution. UP is your projection. So you look at here is that you really are interested in the error between your numerical solution to the exact solution. And that can be decomposed into two components. One is your projection error. The projection error has absolutely nothing to do with your numerical method. Method of moment, finite element. Once you have the basic function chosen, that the projection error is determined. And then there's something we call the numerical error. Like it's the distance between your projection solution and your numerical solution. That's the one which is uh, troublesome. When we go to do the electrostatic, if you have this uh, wonderful book by Gilbert and Strain, the Strain and Fix, and the Professor Strain will tell you how good is your final solution. Final solution is as good as you can possibly get. What he meant by that is that if you go to do electrostatic kind of problem, the process will pull some. The numerical error will be on the same order of your projection. So they are the same quality. So the total numerical error between your exact solution and your numerical solution is the sum of these two parts. The first one is the projection. And what you do in a numerical computation, if I want to put it into the uh, uh, drug language, is you are trying not to screw that. Okay, this is the additional error that you introduce by your numerical error. You would like this error to be smaller than your projection error. At the worst, you want it to be about the same order, okay? And a lot of times we fail. <clears throat> and then uh, if you come to uh, so-called the FDTD, when you use the regular grid, then you use the regular grid, then you see this uh, so-called dispersion error in the one dimension. It goes up, so you see you uh, go a bigger and bigger kind of problem, the dispersion error means uh, uh, bigger and bigger. So for the electrodynamic, for the electrodynamic, this is relation do not hold. That's a, pro that's, a, that's a problem with the electrodynamic, electromagnetic wave of phenomenon. And this is a, a, a topic which uh, has been studied by quite a bit by, by Busca and uh, uh, his uh, colleague uh, doing the uh, so-called uh, I give you a better analysis of the square kind of element. So they found is that uh, for electrodynamic, your numerical error is going to be bounded by a fashion here. So interesting here is that it's not only depending on your polynomial order, it's not only depending on your uh, resolution, your element size, but also depending on your size of your problem. L. L is your total length of your problem domain, and K is your work number. So you see this numerical error is actually increased when your problem domain becomes bigger. So that's where the curse of uh, this dispersion comes. And that's kind of uh, interesting. So how do you uh, uh, see physical meaning from that? This is actually from here, you can see this. If you go on to do FTTD, FTTD is a sort of a, some of the uh, speakers talk about the lattice theory of the electromagnetics, uh, the lattice theory of Maxwell equations. So you see, you have a discretized form of a Maxwell equation. FTTD is like that. Once you discretize it, the velocity of the light is no longer the same as the, it is not, it's, the velocity of light, uh, velocity of the light is no longer 2.9. Roman, you remember the exact number? <laughs> I use a three to a power uh, to three times a power to ten. Okay, uh, uh, ten to a power of eight. I use that to be the uh, speed of light. But when you go to do the FTTD, depending on the resolution, the speed of light will be different. Also, 
depending on the angle of uh, your wave for propagating your FTTT grid, the velocity of the light will be different too. But there's a consistent uh, feature. They are always smaller than the true speed of light. So in the FTTT, then you start to see, oh, they are always, the numerical wave uh, propagate slower than the true speed of light. So if I go this, I have a one degree lagging. If I go this, it's going to be two degree lagging. Three degree lagging is always add up to it. That's the reason the FTTT has this uh, dispersion uh, error and the curse of dispersion. In a fine element, if you use, uh, say, Cartesian grid, you are on the same boat. However, in a fine element, we do tetrahedra. And here's a very interesting thing that reminds me of uh, when I start doing my 3D uh, thesis. The first thing which I do is actually I went to a, a convenience store and buy me some couple, and I actually build myself the tetrahedra. I build, do you know that uh, one uh, cube can be cut into how many tetrahedra? You have two possibilities. You can break one cube into five tetrahedra, or you can break one cube into six tetrahedra. So you see, and that itself already have some implication. Look at here. For the uh, say the six tetrahedra, your speed of light, your numerical speed of light is bigger. The zero here means actually the, the true speed of light. Your numerical speed of light in the fine element, when you are trying to break your cube into six tetrahedra, the speed of light in general are bigger than the true speed of light, only in a very small region, then it becomes smaller. But if you break your cube into five tetrahedra, interesting enough, depending on your angle of a wave, your wave can, your velocity can be bigger or smaller can be bigger or smaller than the true speed of light. So that's where my colleague Robert uh, uh, run into some arguments with the They always say that you have a dispersion error. But you see, when you have, uh, using the five tetrahedra, and you have a completely unstructured mesh, your wave is going to travel in the random fashion. So in certain tetrahedra, you are faster, and in certain tetrahedra, you are smaller, so they cancel out. When everything is random, it becomes the average value surface. Okay, that's the reason in, in doing the, uh, say, unstructured fine element, we seldom concern with the dispersion error. Unless you, you are trying to be smart and using the sort of a regular type of uh, grid. Here's an example. This is a uh, cavity example. This is a cavity, and you use a fine element. Oh, if you look at this geometry, this is easy. What, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just measure this segment, and I'm going to repeat, 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 repeat. So I'm going to use uh, this uh, mesh in, uh, say, one tenth of the, the cylinder here, and I'm going to repeat that mesh 10 times. Bad idea. OK? In doing the fine element, you want it to be uh, structure as much as possible so you can cancel out all of the dispersion. When you try to make it so regular, you see this is uh, the paper which I, I take the data from uh, German Jin's uh, paper. You see in here, wow, the agreement is pretty damn good, but uh, at the angle, when you are about 30 degree, the, there's a quite a big difference between the measurement and the simulation. And, uh, and that is because uh, the mesh was used because the smart people like to do things which are more regular. So they use that regular mesh. So that when you use that regular mesh, you see the repetition. There's a one degree error here, then you'll be two degree, three degree, four degree, five degree. So the dispersion error uh, accumulated in the, the, in the longitudinal direction. So we go on and just measure this as a one single object and completely have a random tetrahedron. Pretty much the same size. It's pretty much the same uh, discretization. Now you see the agreement between the measurement and the simulation is quite, quite good. So this is something which is interesting. The engineer actually know 
uh, so we try and error which you know a bit more than uh, the uh, classification. Because they keep on telling you that uh, you see the fine element, but you go to electrically large problem, you are going to suffer this curse of a dispersion. Practically, that may not be a concern. So uh, that's the uh, successful of the uh, vector fine element and uh, uh, making uh, 800, uh, 800 million dollars for my advisor. So he, he now is a retire wonderfully and uh, has a wonderful life. Yeah, I was uh, stupid enough at the time I didn't know what stock, stock uh, option meant. So that's the reason I'm talking today here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, come to the uh, missile moment, uh, uh, sort of uh, the uh, boundary element. Again, you start with uh, the representation formula, you start with uh, the representation formula, you write down the reaction principle, E dot J and H dot M, and come up with your reaction integral, and uh, from there you you do your wonderful kind of muscle moment, plug into your basic function, and then uh, in, the, in the early days, the uh, majority of that is that we have a trouble to do it, uh, numerical integration. So whenever we see the uh, singular kernel, we try to mitigate that singular kernel, kernel as much as possible. So we do integration by part, so we reduce the uh, singular kernel from the hyper singular to the weakly singular, so that's the common uh, formulation that you see in the missile moment. And uh, yeah, missile moment, uh, the geometry is order h square, and you got uh, with the uh, uh, e by e, for example, and then uh, there's a sum of one known uh, uh, the deficiency of resonance moment, your condition, there's matrix, uh, internal resonance. One by one, there's a solution to that. Internal resonance, C by e, and uh, your condition, called wrong, and uh, no frequency breakdown. And then the wonderful thing that uh, Andreali uh, uh, and the colleague did in this conference. And then uh, with a short corner, you also deteriorate your condition number. But the main complaint in the early days really is, is, is such, it's too slow. Yeah. And, but uh, in the last, uh, I think, uh, uh, 20 years, one of the, the, the biggest advancement in the CEM is really the, the speed up over the missile movement. So many wonderful kind of algorithms have been uh, proposed. And then you have a sort of a rank of defi deficiency kind of uh, data compression scheme. You have a FFT based method. You have uh, the most famous FML. So let me uh, show you all of the things in a very simple way that you can actually take away and understand how did all of the things work. So best of all, when they, if you don't do anything smart to it, it's going to take all the n squared to do a matrix vector multiplication that is too expensive. So let's look at here the mm, uh, meso moment. So you take this meso moment, uh, if this is your target, let's, if we talk about scheduling problem, if this is your target, so the first thing you do is actually break up your target into two parts. If you break it up into two parts, then your matrix is kind of a two by two matrix here. The cell channel and uh, the yellow one is the one which is near. They touch each other, but they are the cell. Nothing you can do about it. So you go up to the second level and break up. I use a stupid uh, just to demonstrate concept. So it's a binary tree kind of a partition. So if you break it up into a four uh, group, then you have, a, you have a four by four. Here is kind of interesting now. Group one and group three, they don't touch each other. They don't touch each other. We call that radiation couple. And one and four, group one and four, don't touch each other. They are also radiation coupled. If they are radiation coupled group, there are a lot of things we can do. Okay? There's a lot of things that we can do. All of radio deficiency, uh, FFT, FFM, all based upon the radiation coupled. So if you look at uh, just uh, the level two, the A13 block, A13 block really is written like this, the basic function. This will be your RWG, and this is your Green's function, and this is uh, your uh, sort of a trial uh, RWG or the trial antenna. Yeah? So, one of the, 
you, if you don't have a missile molding code and you want to go back and just start writing that, one of the easy way to do it is, let's use the SVD. You will go to the radiation and you can, well again, you will just go to the uh, level two and you can, you can separate your matrix into two parts. The cell term and near term and the radiation term. And because it's a radiation coupling, we think there might be a rent deficiency uh, phenomenon. So if you go out and uh, do SPD of the A13, just simply use SPD. And then the effective rate will be K13, for example. And that K13, we hope the K13 will be much smaller than the original number of numbers you have in the N1. So that's a rank deficiency uh, kind of a, uh, uh, mantra. The, the, the reason why rank deficiency can reduce the computation time is because the effective rank can be smaller than the number of RWG basic functions that you use. In a limit, the complexity don't change, but in a static, that's indeed the case. In a static limit, the, uh, the K will be actually bonded. Okay? But uh, for the electron dynamic, eventually the complexity don't change. But still, when you go out to, uh, to do it for the practical purpose, for the practical purpose, you are going to see significant reduction of uh, the number of load. So the K here, if you use, uh, say, 10 to the minus 4 as your threshold, the K here will be significantly small than the number of RWG that you use. So this practically can be quite useful. And then if you are not happy with this, you can continue to do the multi-level, so and so forth. So that's the uh, sort of uh, the, the principle behind the regular deficiency. But if you just simply use the simple SVD, if you just simply use the simple SVD, then the U and B here will be depending on both. I really need to speed up. Okay, quickly. So the uh, uh, NFT, you simply just uh, uh, using the uh, basic function for your Green's function, and uh, once you do that, it becomes uh, a topless matrix. Okay. So I spent too much time on the past. Let's move quickly to to the present. <laughs> oh. I guess uh, the computer gets scared once I start talking about the present me. Huh? <laughs> using the conformal kind of a computation, but for many of the problems which I need to do, I spend months just to mesh it. Mesh, M-E-S-H, is a four-letter word, okay? And for people who do that, you realize what I'm talking about. Mesh really is a four-letter word. Okay, so we are trying to reduce our burden on the machine. So this is what, uh, what I've been spending the last 10 years of my life doing a so-called non-conformal kind of vehicle computation and uh, putting everybody into the, into the, uh, the group. So 10 years ago, I will tell you that if I'm working on a don't even work on the mess of moment. Fenerbahce is the best. 
I will tell you all the deficiency of a best of moment. But in the last 10 years, I will tell you everything that has a good point, I want it. So if you are doing the PO and the very nice PO work, please work with me, I want your code. Okay, I want every single numerical method because to do a really challenging numerical computation, you need all the help you can get. So if, you P, if a PO can do smooth service and electrically not, use it. If a mess of moment can reduce your unknown and uh, put the unknown on the service, use it. If a fine element can do and model your metal material with all the, all the material in homogeneity, use it. Okay, so be inclusive, not exclusive. So that's what we've been working in the last 10 years, so called the Marty Soma Double Composition. Okay, so. Uh, <coughs> I really need to go on quickly. I just want to show you a few very important things. So in order for us to do all this uh, kind of uh, uh, non formal computation, uh, so here's an example to show you the kind of uh, non conformal thing. So to do this kind of packaging problem, think about it. If uh, you are asked to match this up, you may as well kill yourself. Okay. Yeah, it's a really uh, complicated thing to mention. But I want to show you here is uh, the recent uh, development in the last uh, uh, few years that we actually able to do missile moment in a non conformal way. So we don't use RWG anymore. We actually want to push to use, uh, say, localized, and we want to use a different kind of element. As you can see here, the Element here, they are completely different resolution and uh, uh, they, are, they are not conformal. Like uh, the airplane you see here, we mesh each part completely independent. Completely independent. So, in the uh, first uh, attempt in doing the uh, so called discontinuous galactic, uh, galactic uh, integral equation, you go on to the uh, traditional kind of uh, formulation. So, we do integration by part and then uh, Come out of that will be a contour integral. So this is the contour integral that we have. So here are the contour integral that we have. And if you go on to do it, then you realize that one of the contour integral is is not integrable. If you really try to integrate that, it gives you infinity. Okay? So and my student come to me and say that's not integrable. I say screw it, throw it away. And it worked. And uh, as a good uh, engineer, we go back and check what the mathematics. You see, even though this is infinity, infinity doesn't scale you. Zero shouldn't scale you either. Infinity multiplied by zero can be anything. If you do it right, infinity multiplied by zero will give you zero. So even though that part of a contour is infinity, but the solution I'm looking for when you take that infinity multiplied by that particular solution I'm looking for, it's a zero. That means that I can take it away. You see, ax equal to, to b, if you look at the matrix equation, ax equal to b, if you know bx equal to zero, then a plus bx is still equal to b. Okay, so you can add any matrix to your original matrix as long as you know your solution is a null space of that operator. That's the kind of a justification for that the so-called control penalty that we do. And it work. Okay? Yeah. So you are able to move now using the square integral kind of basic function and uh, uh, half a WG instead of the entire WG. But then you still need to have a control integral. You still have a control integral. Those are the integral kind of control. So life will be much easier if you know how to do hyper-singular integration. Life will be much easier if you know how to do hyper-singular integral. If you don't do integration by part, there's no control, there's no nothing. All you need to do is to figure out how to do hyper-singular integration. There are two ways. One, by green guard. One, by new. First one is uh, by green guard, so-called quadrature by expansion, QPX. And uh, again, from uh, uh, Green Guard, it will be addition theorem based.
So this is uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, the QBX uh, is about. So if you do this uh, kind of vessel moment, you have this uh, double integral, you have a Gaussian quadrature point. So on every single Gaussian quadrature point, you construct a sphere. You construct a sphere. And that, the radius of that sphere needs to be small enough to be accurate. But then you are now on that particular uh, patch where you are currently resides. You are trying to compute the electric field right at the center of your sphere. Right at the center of your sphere, there's no singularity involved. So you can actually compute your electric field at the center C, like you see there. So this is a location where your sources are reside, and you are computing your electric field on the location of C. But you, you actually support and uh, uh, interpolate it by spherical harmonic. So you are approximating your electric field around C by spherical harmonic. And spherical harmonic is a smooth function. Afterwards, you take that spherical harmonic expansion you have, do the analytic continuation, bring it down to the location where you want your Gaussian quadrature point. Yes. Like this, the QBX that the green guy proposed to do. So, on um, every single Gaussian quadrature point, you have a, a sphere for you to do this uh, uh, spherical harmonic expansion. And take that spherical harmonic expansion, analytic continuation, onto the surface. And you can do this integration in a very parallel way with FMM. So this is the entire flow chart. Giuliano is already <laughs> not uh, very... So let me introduce my way of doing this. So for the rows. So you look at this uh, uh, electromagnetic problem you have. This is the original problem you have. And this is your year by year, your F by year. But then think about the auxiliary problem. If you take out your PEC and you replace it by QA, so this is an auxiliary problem. The auxiliary problem has nothing, it's all pure air. But you still discretize it, you see, then you still discretize it, and you still have your year by year, F by year. And all your print wave are solution to that. You discretize it, you get the same equation here. If you use the same basic function, the air operator in your original problem will be the same as the air operator here. But you know the solution here. So you can use your solution to reverse engineering to find out what your operator gets. Like this, rules is the problem. I am now computing my engine by plugging the solution that is satisfied. Okay? So, on uh, every single rule over your ear by ear, for example, the hypersingular only involves very few number of terms. If you use a conformal, there will be only five terms, which is a hypersingular. If you use a constant basic function, there are only two terms, which are hypersingular. So all you need is just a two basic problem, a two plane wave solution that you are able to, to do a reverse engineering and compute the entry of your matrix. So you actually don't integrate your entry, you compute your entry from the reverse engineering way. So here's I'm showing you that by doing that, the, you recover the consistent uh, kind of uh, truncation error for constant basic function or the edge. You see, you are able to use a constant basic function. In before, when you do integration by part, the constant basic function will not have a convergent property. But now, don't do integration by part, you have a traditional interpolation kind of a bond, all the edge. And then they go on with the MFMA to make the rows to be uh, sort of uh, conform, uh, to, to, to be uh, efficient. So you see here it's the computation by using all of the constant basis. You have a quad, you have a triangle, and for the quad, we have a two unknown. For the triangle, we have two unknown. So this is the comparison with the mean series, and you can do the same for the complicated structure. And then uh, you see, by using rules, we can also do the uh, antenna ring in a much, the unit cell is no longer this, the, the straight sided. We have this uh, unit cell, which is much more complicated and able to kind of uh, put them all together. So let me use this to be my last slide, okay? In the future, I think we need to spend more time doing this. Is that, like I keep on emphasize to you, mesh is a four letter word, okay? When you do the real computation, today is much better now, all this commercial company, most of them have a pretty robust mesh generation, but still mesh is not uh, 
an easy task. Consider also even the, 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 the situation. Most engineering job, you don't, you don't do the, say, the, the once for all. You actually do design, so you will probably change the wind. Okay, so in the traditional way of doing it, once you change the wind, you need to change the entire geometry. You need to repeat all the all the processes from scratch again. But if we can do this in the following way, so what I intend to do in the future yet, the geometry itself is a mesh. So we will will work with the capture directly using that to be the mesh and to be a discretization. And if you look at my talk in the very beginning, I tell you that. You see, a lot of times we actually have the physical engineering problem and we translate that into a mathematical model. And from that mathematical model, we enter into the computer, into the, the model that the computer can understand. And then we, we, we continue by doing our mathematics to try to solve the solution and do the visualization. 99% of our effort is spending up here, the mathematical model. That is uh, a bit wrong. We need to spend a bit more time thinking about how to enter your, your problem such that it will be easy for the computer to understand your problem. Okay, so uh, I was uh, uh, very glad to, 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 to see uh, Andrea is already thinking of using a virtual reality. You see, I'm also trying to see whether I can use a virtual reality to do the scientific visualization of uh, electromagnetic computation. We need to start thinking outside just a pure mathematics to do a real engineering application there are it is a system problem to solve it's not just involved mathematics only with that i uh, advocate uh, what my future plan is thank you thank you Lisa. I think uh, our chairman will allow a few questions. Okay, so are there any questions? Uh, what's a rose? <laughs> it stands for reverse operation, self consistent evaluation. So, in terms of, uh, say, the uh, integral equation. Uh, so let's just go back here again. So uh, let's uh, let's go to have a Q and A so I can use uh, five minutes to come back to to rules again. So look at this. On the top is a problem that you want to solve. It's a PEC schedule you want, you want to solve. Okay, so on the top is the PEC scattering that you want to solve. And then this is the EFID you have, this is MFID you have. And then if you are uh, plug into the basic function and you, you don't do integration by part, then you will end up with the L operator which corresponds to this. So this is the, the L matrix times X equal to B. So this is the problem you try to solve. So traditionally you will try to, to do all kinds of ways that you can do that integration. Now I'm saying in, in the in the matrix L here, 99% of the entry do not have a compute. They are not single. Only the self term they are single. That's a one that you can. So in order to do all those uh, kind of uh, uh, troublesome singular entries, I create a single problem, which is on the bottom. So it's the same geometry, but this time, there's no PEC, it's just a pure A. So I can discretize this problem again. Sure, sure. And yeah. I end up with uh, the Equation which I know the solution. Exactly, yeah. I just thought what's in a name. Yeah, the thing okay. we call a roast. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, roast by any other name, right? Yeah. Any questions? That's good. What kind of evolution do you foresee with respect to the evolution in, in computing facilities? So do we focus on supercomputers, on massive parallel, on many GPUs? How do we keep our code in track with the evolution in, in computing? Yeah, you, you, you definitely need to pay attention to the uh, computer hardware. So a lot of things that you do uh, require very little uh, memory, but a lot of uh, 
uh, independent calculation, like uh, filling the, the matrix entry, those are perfectly for GPU. So you need to do the MPI, uh, OpenMP, and also the GPU prioritization. That's what we are doing right now. So the GPU part, trivial, done. You get almost 100% efficiency because uh, all the matrix filling is completely independent and they don't take that much memory. Okay, so GPU is perfect for that. And then the OpenMP, these days, you spend about $10,000, you can get a machine with a sheer memory about one terabyte. Yeah. If that's not enough, that's where you go to do the, uh, the MPI. So that's what we are doing. Yeah. We, we've done a pretty good job on it, OpenMP, but the MPI part is still is, uh, a bit troublesome. Do we have these capabilities in our laptops, you think, with all these GPUs and such? The, we need to talk to the hardware people, right? Yeah. Okay. okay yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a very good point, that uh, we need to network outside our area to, to the people who make hardware, or even the people that who make the software. Just uh, you, 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 you ask uh, all the good questions, you cannot go without punishment. Okay. <laughs> the, we were doing the uh, multi front in, in my group, and I said that sucks. That's a really big, really, really uh, uh, a lousy artist. It's so slow. My students go to a commercial company. They have the money, so they work in with Intel. So they have a blast, which is perfectly chill for them. Wow! Right. It's fast. Okay, so you need to work with the hardware. Yeah. There's so many people too. I mean, just a second. That opens a the different kind of one. Yeah. <coughs> because uh, you, you talk to the company, you talk to the, uh, the, the sponsor, they will not like that. Yeah. Okay. Let us thank you uh, again, our speaker, and uh, I think it's time.